I can never make it all the way through that hymn without crying. <laughs> Almost today, but when we got to that last frame about I'll be there as one of the throng, beauty came to mind. She's there with one of the throng. Calvary covers it all. What a magnificent, incredible, wonderful thought of gracious goodness of God and praise. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus. The portion of text before us today, verses 19 through 23, because we've had several interruptions and we're going to have another interruption next week with Father's Day. Uh, I want to give a quick overview of what we've seen so far here in this chapter. The lessons that are very important lessons for us to learn if we would follow God the way God wants us to follow Him. You recall that the last time, last week, June 1st, the message was entitled, Expect Trouble When You Want to Serve God. Expect Trouble When You Want to Serve God. And the trouble that we'll see today as we move farther into the text is rebellion against God's leader. And so Moses, being in the center of the will of God by this time, doing what God has called him to do, initially having what appears to be success as he comes to the Jewish people, now, as we read in our text today, finds that those junior leaders, those who are subordinate to his leadership among the Jewish people, now have been turned against him. Now there's some bitterness, now there's some anger, now there's some resentment, now there's some complaining and questioning whether or not God really did send him after all. Let's look at these lessons very quickly once again where we left off last week. Number one was the lesson of frustrated faith. Too often we expect immediate results to our faith and our worship. God had made a promise to Moses that he would certainly keep, but his timing and his ways are not always our ways. And we saw that we had at least four principles that were derived from that lesson. Number one, in spiritual warfare, there's rarely instant and permanent victory. It's a war, not a skirmish. Number two, the walk of faith. There is rarely instant gratification. It's a walk, not a sit down. Number three, timing does not belong to man. Timing belongs to God. Number four, there will always be tests to our faith to accomplish three things. Number one, to prove that our faith is real, not merely an attempted escape hatch from our problems. Number two, to strengthen our faith. And number three, to develop our patience and draw us closer to God. We saw that the immediate preceding verses, we saw the entrance of Moses into the presence of Pharaoh, and it, it stated that he was in the right relationship with God. It stated that the people were in the right relationship with God. The last part of the previous chapter made it very clear that the people were right with God when they started out. The people believed, and when they had heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. It's at that point that Moses went into Pharaoh. Everything seems just exactly the way it's supposed to be. And so often we, as God's people, think, finally we've got it right. Finally we're doing what God has called us to do. And so therefore we must going to have glorious success. <laughs> and then it doesn't happen. That's lesson one, the lesson of frustrated faith. Lesson number two was the lesson of leadership disappointment. Leadership doesn't always get the results that they'd expect it, even when the leaders are doing the right thing. And the followers are doing the right thing under the leaders. Moses had some frustrated leadership disappointment. I have, throughout ministry years, many times had leadership disappointment. But God has purposes in that. Number one, God may be setting the stage for judgment on sin, and that, of course, is obviously what's happening here. Pharaoh is getting set up for judgment. Number two, God has purposes even in those disappointments because God is going to reach the greatest amount of his own glory through what he is doing. That's guaranteed even when leaders have disappointment. Number three, through our leadership disappointment, God is also teaching people to trust him. Not merely to trust the leader, but to learn to trust him. When this leader or any other leaders here in this church disappoint you, have you learned the lesson that God is trying to teach you to trust him instead of trusting the human leaders? Human leaders will always fail you, including this preacher here. 
The third lesson that we learned is God always works through human authority, even bad authority. God established the principles of the spheres of authority, and because God has established that, he will work through those spheres of authority. He expects his people to, to obey the divine chain of command, if you will, because he established it. Even when we think that the initial results of doing so are not beneficial. Too often we say, well, you know, it's not turning out the way I wanted, so I'm going to get out from under my authority. And by getting out from under my authority, I think I can do a better job than if I followed God's will of obeying my authority and learning to trust him to work through my authorities. Now, we know there are times when intermediary authority, here's God, here's the intermediary authority, here's us. And that intermediate authority may be in terms of government, it may be in terms of parental authority, it may be in terms of your employment authority. There are different spheres of authority which God has ordained. And sometimes those people will tell you to do something that is directly in disobedience to the Word of God or prohibit you from doing something that the Word of God commands. And that's what's happening in our text here today. That's why we find that Moses and Aaron don't go back to work like Pharaoh tells them to do because they've been sent on a message from God. God has told them, tell Pharaoh, this is my word. Now, Pharaoh, you have to obey it. Pharaoh decides I'm not going to obey God. Who is the Lord? I know not the Lord. Get back to work. Pharaoh chooses to disobey God. We know that there are cases like that, but normally what God does is he works through those who are put in authority over us, and even with Pharaoh, God sent Moses and Aaron first to Pharaoh. He didn't just take the children of Israel out of Egypt, because God had a greater purpose, and that purpose was he was going to judge the land of Egypt. He was going to judge Pharaoh. He was going to kill Pharaoh's firstborn son. He was going to decimate the population. He was going to destroy the land so that all the nations would know that he is God major lesson that God wanted to teach. He could have done it many other ways. He could have made them all invisible and had them sneak out some other way and everybody wonders where are the Egyptians or where are the Israelites. He didn't do that because he was going to glorify himself. Important lesson to learn. Lesson number four was resistance to small inconveniences results in big inconveniences. Moses and Aaron asked for a three-day journey into the wilderness to sacrifice. Pharaoh resisted and so Pharaoh lost his entire workforce. He got the ten plagues. He had his country annihilated. He had his own son killed. He had the total permanent loss of his entire workforce. God gave him opportunities to do right, and Pharaoh chose not to do right. You know, it's interesting. Uh, in the context of all of this, Pharaoh was in the process of trying to uh, remove all of the male babies from the Israelites. He had a birth control plan. He wanted to get rid of all those little boy babies and just keep the girl babies alive. You know, it's interesting that in the history of the world, when you think of birth control limits enforced by government, you may think of places like China, or you may think of Hitler, who sterilized people. But did you know that here in the United States, our own government has had forced sterilization of people that they did not want to reproduce? Most of you probably don't know that. But you would know about it if you came on a regular basis on Wednesday evening and saw the series on biblical medical ethics that we showed last year. We had Dr. Georgia Purdom on the video talking about the way in which the United States government, at one point in our history for a period of about 20 years, was sterilizing the people they didn't want to reproduce. People, it can happen here in the United States, it could happen here tomorrow. It could happen if the government decides we're tired of having Christians in this country. We're going to sterilize all of those Christians so that they will not reproduce. How sad that Christians haven't reproduced as extensively as they possibly could. Would there be a different group of people in the United States today if Christians had decided that children were the heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb was his reward? And blessed is the man who has his quiver full of them. Whoever heard of going into war with 1.8 arrows? The quiver is where you put your arrows for doing battle. Okay, I'll quit, stop preaching and quit meddling. <laughs> um, he said to people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And Pharaoh said unto the midwives, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, you shall kill him. Hmm, abortion. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. 
China it's the other way around. They kill the girls and try to keep the boys alive, and now they've got this humongous population of males that have no wives, and they're beginning to change some of their theories about this. Pharaoh also thought that demonic magic could trump divine power, and the important lesson, the takeaway lesson that we learn from that is never arrogantly assume on the inability of God to accomplish his will or the long patience of God. It will always lead you to trouble. Remember, wrong premises lead to wrong conclusions. Make sure your premises are based squarely on scripture, not a premise that the devil is stronger than God because a lot of times we act like that. We, we follow that subtle suggestion that really God can't control this situation in my life, so I have to do this. You know, you've all heard those kinds of scenarios where, you know, it really looks like you have to violate some biblical moral principle in order to accomplish what is the greater good. Do not believe it. Your job is to obey God and leave the results to God. It may cost you your life. It has cost Christians their life throughout the history of the world. But our job is to obey what God told us to do, to do right and leave the results to God. Not try to manipulate the results so that it turns out the way we think that it's best. Lesson number five was don't expect unregenerates to obey God. Moses and Aaron gave a direct command to Pharaoh from God and Pharaoh responded, I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. That, of course, response, that kind of response, always ends with judgment from God. So never respond to his commands that way. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Lesson number six was we must obey God even when our authority figures do not obey God. Now, if Pharaoh had repented, and we do not know what would have been, but had he repented, we know the general principle of Scripture that those who repent and obey receive the blessing of God. Pharaoh didn't repent and obey, but might there have been a difference in world history if Pharaoh had obeyed? Might there have been future blessings upon Egypt as a nation? If Pharaoh had said, yes, I'd like to help you in your journey to serve God. He placed a curse upon his nation that extends down all the way till today. Look at what's going on in Egypt. And I'm not going to get into politics at this point. We find that in the book of Acts, we are told that we must obey God rather than men. Acts chapter 4, verses 17 through 20. Acts chapter 5, verses 27 and following. We find the apostles are obeying God regardless of what the intermediaries tell them because they have a direct command from God. Lesson number seven. There are consequences for not obeying that will fall on us if we don't obey God. If we obey, those consequences will fall on those who hinder our obedience. We saw that happening here. Uh, they say to Pharaoh in verse 3, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Now, here is a phrase, here's a line that we don't read God saying it, but they're quoting God. So we don't have everything that God may have said to Moses because we see here that Moses says God told us that he would fall on us with pestilence or with the sword if we don't obey him. You know, that's what happened to Pharaoh because Pharaoh tried to stop them from obeying God. So God said, okay, they tried to obey me. You resisted them. Now it's going to hit you. You got the pestilence. You got the sword. You got the problems now, Pharaoh. And the ten plagues hit Egypt. Lesson number eight, knowing God personally and having his direct commands is not a guarantee that things will go smoothly in your life. You as believers know God personally. You as believers who have the Bible translated into English in your own language, you know his directions specifically. Has either of those two things meant that everything went well in your life? Everything is smooth. You've never had any trouble. You've never been sick. You've always been rich. All the things that the prosperity gospel preachers preach at you. No, of course not. God gives us those things so that he can strengthen us through the times of battle, through the times of adversity, through the times of difficulty. That's why he gave us a personal relationship with him, so that we would learn to trust him and his power and not human power. So that we would learn his instructions from his word as to how to handle the situations that face us in daily life. And he does do that for us. 
Lesson number nine that we learned was, if you identify with God's people, you will come under the same human restrictions placed on God's people. We saw that Pharaoh commanded Moses and Aaron to get back to work, and they didn't obey Pharaoh because they were on an errand from that higher authority. The king of Egypt said unto them, verse 4, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their work get you unto your business? And then number 10, when you're obeying God, expect to be falsely accused of wrong motives. Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. Lesson 11, and here's where we gave some application for our modern American society. Usually the secular authorities who oppose God use intermediaries to carry out their dirty work. We gave examples of political authorities using non-political instruments such as the police, military, fire departments, quasi-governmental medical personnel, and the courts to come against you as God's people. Hitler used medical personnel extensively against the Jews. Oppressive governments always try to control the health professions and the issues of life and death, and that's what you see going on here in the United States today. Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, Number 12, expect the first level attack to be an economic attack that makes your work more difficult. That's what happened here in our text. Pharaoh removed the necessary ingredients that enabled them to do effective work. We suggested that we should expect sometime in the future that the government will remove the tax-exempt status of churches, which will definitely truncate the effectiveness of their works of charity and mission. It will probably come in four stages, and we noted those. We'll not go into that in detail. I'll just list them for you. The denial of deductions for donations to religious causes will go first. Other nonprofits will be able to keep their uh, deduction, deductibility of their uh, the donations to them the, under sec Section 170 of the IRC Code. Denial of property tax exemption is a big property here. In the last two weeks, we've had a realtor trying to contact us to buy off some of this property to put up a big uh, tax-paying place on this corner here. You know, cities like to pull in tax money without raising taxes, and if they take it away from churches, they can do that. That will reduce, that will do three things. Number one, it will reduce the amount of donated money that can be used for ministry purposes. Number two, that would make large gatherings of Christians in large buildings increasingly difficult. Number three, that would have the dual impact of secularizing church properties when the churches sell out and turn the property back over under the tax rolls as secular organizations buy out church buildings. And that's happened in many places already. Number three, churches would then be taxed on any trust fund and interest income that they currently have as tax exempt. Number four, churches would then be actively taxed on donations received as though they were rending taxable goods and services, not merely denying the deductibility of donations to the donors. Pharaoh removed the government benefits from the Israelites, which made their work harder. You shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as heretofore let them go and gather straw for themselves. He still required them to do as much work as they had done before. Direct pressure, notice it, was put on the men, the principal breadwinners of the family. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. The men are going to have to sweat it. The men are going to quit listening to the vain words. The women might keep on working even with that extra burden, but they'll, and they'll still listen to those words. Put the pressure on the men. Put the pressure on the men. The men are pragmatists. The men are realists. The men will say, look, this is not getting anywhere. We're going to stop listening to Moses. We're going to get back to work, and we're going to see if we can get back in good with Pharaoh. Lesson 13. Special pressure will be put, and this is where we left off. Special pressure will be put on the leaders of the religious organizations, especially those who must answer to the governmental intermediaries. That includes, in our context, people like pastors, elders, deacons, and trustees, and treasurers, down here in verse 14. In our text, this resulted in what might be parallel to what you see going around today. If you are in contact with any Christian organizations, especially Christian legal organizations, and I get lots and lots and lots of emails from Christian legal organizations, you will know that out there on the Internet right now are a lot of clergy petitions. They're trying to get clergymen to sign on to the petitions for various things. You have an illustration of it in your bulletin today, and I encourage you to participate in that. That's why I put the thing in your bulletin, but pleading the case of persecuted Christians. Our government doesn't care. And here's a very specific instance of the government not caring. You can see the picture of the young couple there on the back, just got married. 
the wife, mother of a brand new little baby, rotting away in a jail. People, yeah, we do need to petition our government. You got a lot of them out there. But that kind of pressure is being put on leaders of religious organizations, especially those who answer the governmental intermediaries. Petitions begging the president to intervene on behalf of persecuted Christians. Petitions asking that the government ease up on IRS regulations, and I know a lot of you signed on to that kind of a thing. Number three, petitions asking the administration to instruct the Department of Justice to uphold the laws passed by Congress and stop issuing illegal executive orders to circumvent Congress, and the list could go on and on. You've seen them, lots and lots of petitions out there. Here we've got a group of intermediary leaders, the junior leaders of the children of Israel, going in to petition Pharaoh. Why in the world are you doing this? Don't you realize that it's your people who have taken away the straw from us so we cannot make the bricks? Sure, I realize it. I'm the one that gave the order, so get back to work. You're too idle, you're too lazy. If you have enough time to think of ideas like going on a three-day vacation and going out there and sacrificing to the Lord, whom I don't know and I don't care about him, you're too idle, get back to work. We're going to make it harder for you. If you come back in here again, you wait and see what happens to you next time. Folks, there are Christians who are going to court right now over that. I'm certainly glad for groups like the uh, Institute for Justice. I'm glad for groups that are like the ADF, Alliance Defending Freedom, of which I'm a part. I'm glad for other Christian organizations that are out there, Rutherford Institute and so on. But you know, it's getting harder and harder as we go to court to fight some of these battles. A lot of things are tipping the wrong direction we see the moral structure of our society falling apart. Do you understand that that's the principle behind what's going on here in our text with Pharaoh? Of course, we know the end of the story when it comes to Pharaoh. That happened 1400 BC, 1445 BC. But we're sweating it out here in 2014 AD. And we tend to forget that there is a God who's in control. He was in control back there with Pharaoh and we can say yay cheer, cheer the team cheer the team we see what God's gonna do to Pharaoh but here instead of learning to trust the God who did it to Pharaoh we can trust that same God to handle our government as well doesn't matter what level what branch of government God can handle them just as well and he will when they resist his will and he will when they reject his authority and he will when they deny his moral standards and try to set up the abomination of sodomy as the standard for the United States. We serve a living God. Now, I'll probably get in trouble for that. Doesn't matter, it's the truth. It is the truth of God. People, do not be ashamed of the word of God. Let me give you the steps that we find in our text that are used by oppressive governments against God's people. First, the intermediaries put pressure on God's people as a group. That's verses 10 through 13. The taskmasters of the people went out and their officers and they spake to the people saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. So the intermediaries are putting pressure on God's people as a group. I will not give you straw. Go you, get ye straw where you can find it. Yet naught of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. Yeah, it accomplished something else too, didn't it? It scattered them. Hard to do anything as a unit when you're struggling just to survive. When you're all scattered about. Much easier to do things when you're unified in a central location where you have all the resources necessary for doing what you need to do. They're struggling to survive here. And the taskmasters hasted them, saying, Oh, a lot more pressure. Fulfill your work, your daily tasks, is when there was straw. So the first thing, the intermediaries put pressure on God's people as a group, which tends to get them disorganized. Second, the leaders of God's people are punished individually. Verse 14, And the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, so you see, Pharaoh is up here. Then Pharaoh has his taskmasters, and the taskmasters figure, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to select some of the guys who are Jews to run the program. And by getting them to run the program, it will be more acceptable to the Jews to run the program. Does it ever strike you as interesting that some of you remember back when communism was in control in Russia? 
and it really still is. But back in the days of, say, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, you think back in the days when these churches in Russia, there were official churches that were approved. Same thing in China today. And there are pastors that are approved by the government. They've got guys who have been to seminary, but who are the puppets and being manipulated by their governments. They get them into the churches, and then they do what they're told to do. You know, Pharaoh was no idiot on this subject. He got some Jews to run the program being fulfilled by the Jews. The officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmaster had set over them, were beaten and demanded, Wherefore have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today and heretofore? They didn't go out and try to beat everybody. They beat the Jewish sub-leaders for the Jews not doing their work. Do you think that put a little pressure on them? I think it did. Third, the leaders of God's people were aroused to take action and petition the government for unfair treatment. Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? There is no straw given unto thy servants. And they say unto us, Make brick. And behold, thy servants are beaten. Hey, look, it's not our fault. They say so. But the fault is in thine own people. It's not our problem. It's your people's problem. No, it's not my people's problem. I told my people to do it to you. You better get on the stick and get your people to do what my people tell you to do. Because otherwise, you're going to be the one that suffers. Fourth, governmental leaders. That means courts, legislative bodies, the administration. Deny religious freedom and increase the burden on those who desire to serve God. Verse 17. But he said, Ye are idle, ye are idle. Therefore ye say, Let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now and work. For there shall no straw be given you, yet ye shall deliver the tale of bricks. Oh. It looks like a no-win situation. That's verse 19. The officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case. <laughs> they were in trouble. They were in serious trouble. After it was said, ye shall not minish off from your bricks of your daily tasks. You know, there's a well-known saying, divide and conquer. And Satan, I think, is a master military strategist. He knows there are two basic ways to divide the people of God. Listen carefully. He knows there are two basic ways to divide the people of God. Number one, if he can make the people of God focus on their own petty problems. Because as soon as we start to focus on our own personal petty problems, you know, well, I'm suffering. It's not nothing in this for me. Or, man, I, I can't do this or I can't do that. And we get complaints about different kinds of petty things here in the church all the time. I'm so tired of listening to petty complaints, folks, because you're not willing to do what God asked you to do. I could list some, but I'd be pointing fingers if I did that. We complain about stuff that we really could solve that problem if we just do or take advantage of what's been provided. Had one of those complaints today. You heard it. Number two. By agitating the people against divinely ordained leadership, which is usually accomplished by making them bitter, that leadership is not delivering what the people expected. They look at what's going on, they say, man, the church is so small, leadership's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Leadership should be out there doing the canvassing of the neighborhood. Leadership should be out there doing more on the radio, or leadership should be out there doing this or that or the other, or leadership should be out there uh, working harder and doing more and putting in more hours. Folks? That's Satan dividing churches. Satan used both of those tactics here. He made the people focus on their own petty problems, and then he agitated the people against divinely ordained leadership by making them bitter that the leadership was not delivering what the people expected. Satan knows that if he can divide the people of God, he can destroy the work that God is doing through and, listen, in his people. God doesn't want to merely use you. That's doing his work through you. Satan wants to destroy the work that God is doing in you, which is transforming you into the image of Christ. 
God's goal for you is to transform you so that you think like Christ, so that you speak like Christ, so that you act like Christ, so that your motives are Christ-like, so that your attitudes are Christ-like. Five areas that God is seeking to develop in each and every one of us who knows Jesus Christ as our Savior. And Satan knows that if he can get us focused on our own personal petty problems, which could be resolved in other ways, but we're too stubborn to do it. He knows that if he can get us focused on our petty problems, he'll divide us and destroy us. And then God will not be able to do his work in us, and Satan wins. Secondly, making us bitter against divinely ordained leadership. If he can divide the people of God, he destroys God's work. Jesus put it this way. By the way, this passage here is found in all three synoptic gospels, which means that God wanted us to pay attention to it. If God tells you something once, it's absolute and it's final authority. If it tells you twice, you better pay attention. If he tells you three times, he's hitting you over the head with a hammer saying, wake up. Listen to what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 12, verses 25 and following. And Jesus knew their thoughts. Do you think he knows your thoughts? Yes, he does. What are you thinking about right now? Are you mad at the preacher? Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Satan knows that. Satan tries very hard not to let his kingdom get divided. Jesus is going to tell us that in a minute. But Satan knows the principle. And if he can get God's kingdom divided against itself, it can't stand. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house that is divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. See, they were saying, ah, oh, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then is the kingdom of God come unto you. Lord Jesus Christ, just a few chapters later, just before going to the cross, in Matthew 26, verse 31 says, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye, speaking to the disciples, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. Those are both the principles we just talked about. Principle number one, which is, dividing the people. Principle number two, hit the shepherd. Make the people bitter against the leader. Smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. It may be interesting to you to know that that is a quotation from the book of Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow. Now that's a prophecy of Christ saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. Wish we had time to talk about the context. It looks from the clock back there that we have like two minutes left. So uh, the context here is the judgment against Israel for rejecting Messiah. The context is the ravishing of Jerusalem at the end of the tribulation just before the return of Christ. At that time, two-thirds of the Jews in the land will be slaughtered. Only one-third will remain before the feet of Christ touch down on top of the Mount of Olives and split it right down the middle. That's at the second coming, not the rapture. Rapture takes place, second, uh, seven years of tribulation. Second coming takes place after that. So I encourage you to read that last part of chapter 13 and all of chapter 14 uh, to understand better that relationship because Christ quotes that passage in relation to his crucifixion, his betrayal and crucifixion. Not our theme for today. But it establishes the important principle of Scripture. Moses, the leader of the Exodus, understood that principle when it came time for him to die. He was going to pass on. He knew that God would have to appoint another leader to lead his people without the need for the people to rebel and choose their own leader, which they did later uh, when they chose Saul. They rejected the leadership of Samuel, who was merely a prophet. Uh, they didn't want God as their king. And so this comes out of Ex uh, Numbers chapter 27 when God told Moses that God was going to kill Moses because he had rebelled against God 
when the second time that they needed water in the wilderness, instead of speaking to the rock like God told him to speak to the rock, that second time he smote the rock again and said, What ye rebels must we bring you forth water out of this rock? And he whacked the rock and God graciously gave the water. God said, Because you did not sanctify me in the eyes of the people, you're going to die. You can see the land, but you're going to die on this side of Jordan. You're not going to go over. Oh, people, how important it is to do what God tells us to do. And to do it exactly the way God tells us to do it. Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of all the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord not be as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. Now quickly back to the two strategies that Satan uses to divide God's people and put them in rebellion against divinely appointed leadership. In our context in Exodus, Pharaoh used both of those strategies. First, the Jewish leaders began to hate Moses because they were under personal pressure. Satan and Pharaoh really didn't care about stopping the junior level Jew Jewish leaders. Satan and Pharaoh wanted to stop the senior leaders, Moses and Aaron. If the Jewish leaders quit following the senior leadership direction of Moses and Aaron, Pharaoh and the devil thought that they could beat God. And the officers, this is verse 19, of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case after it was said unto them, ye shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily task. Second, did you notice the accusation that Moses and Aaron did not deliver what they had promised? <laughs> that was a... Point number two that we had a moment ago. Hey, leadership's not delivering what we thought leadership was going to deliver. They didn't deliver what they promised. Suddenly, they're no longer excited about the message and miracles that Moses and Aaron brought to the Jewish elders. Instead, they start the blame game. It's your fault that now we have personal problems. We should never have listened to you in the first place. They met Moses and Aaron, verse 20, who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh, and they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants, and to put a sword in their hand to slay us. Personal problems. Just remember, if the message was true from God in the first place, it's still true, regardless of the temporal results that you're experiencing. Don't blame God's servants for telling you the truth when you don't get what you were hoping for. You see, this war is not about your personal peace, comfort, affluence, and prosperity. It's about the glory of God. There's a second more serious aspect to complaining about what God is doing. In effect, they were accusing God of not delivering what God had promised to deliver. That's very dangerous when you begin to accuse God of not doing what he said. Third, they had bitter spirits and that would only soon spread to others because of the increased pain of their own labors. A bitter spirit will not only trouble you, but the book of Hebrews says that by it many others will be defiled as well. Now, those of you who come on Sunday evening know we did an extensive study on bitterness in the evening service. Uh, 17 different results that happen to you when you have a bitter spirit. I'm sorry to say that most of you missed it. As we look here at the text, this had the additional effect of causing senior leadership, Moses and Aaron, to question four things. Number one, if you read the text carefully, you see they questioned the call of God. It made them question the message of God. Number three, it made them question the sincerity and truth of God. And number four, it made them question the ability of God. Dear people, Moses and Aaron are human too. When each of us fails to follow what God has told us to do, regardless of the consequences, there is a reverse effect too. It comes back to the preacher, as well as going out to the congregation. We find Moses and Aaron questioning it. Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil unto this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. We don't see any movement, not even a smidgen. If, if he had said, well, we'll let you go one day, well, then you're back to work and it's still going to be hard. We don't even see a glimmer of hope. You haven't delivered your people at all. You see, what's happened here has caused Moses and Aaron to question God. 
Satan has a party when he can get divinely ordained leadership to question any of those four things, the call of God, the message of God, the sincerity and the truth of God or the ability of God. Remember, God's ways are not our ways, people. Take your Bibles and turn to one final passage, and I'll, I promise I'll quit with this. Turn over to the book of Isaiah. I just want to stick this in, didn't have it typed out, but we need to remember this. Whenever we're going through these tough times and difficulties, we find that God makes it very clear in verse 8 of Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Give God the opportunity to be God. He does know what he's doing, even when we go through the difficult times of life. And he is the winner. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and for its power. Very practical. The New Testament tells us that these things that were written down in the Old Testament for our learning so that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We're told that the things that happened to Moses and the children of Israel were written as an example for us so that we shouldn't fall into the same kind of temptations and fall into the same sins that they fell into. Which means that those things have practical lessons for the church today. Father, make us a people who by your mercy and grace learn the lesson instead of complaining against you, instead of focusing on our own personal petty problems, instead of focusing on bitterness because leadership doesn't deliver what we thought leadership should deliver, because our real complaint is against you. Moses made that clear to the children of Israel, you've not complained against me, you've complained against the Lord. Father, we pray that you will take your word and, as you have promised, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 610, No One Understands Like Jesus. When you're